So I think we should go ahead and get started. Good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who's joining us today. And hello, welcome to our program on the art of Middle East peace negotiations. My name is Carla Thorson and I'm the senior vice president here at World Affairs. And we're extremely lucky to have joining us today two experts on the Middle East, each of whom have studied the complexities of the Israeli-Palestinian peace process from different vantage points. Their conversation today will help us both make sense of the past efforts to negotiate peace, as well as gain insight into the upcoming challenges in the region. So with that, I'd like to introduce our moderator for the conversation, Janine Zakaria. Janine has reported on the Middle East and foreign policy for close to two decades, including her time as Jerusalem Bureau Chief for the Washington Post from 2009 to 2011, where she covered Israel, the West Bank, Gaza, and nations throughout the region. She's currently the Carlos Kelly McClatchy Lecturer in the Department of Communication at Stanford University, where she teaches news reporting and foreign correspondence. She was the recipient of Stanford's 2020-21 Dean's Award for Distinguished Teaching in the School of Humanities and Sciences, and the co-author of the Newsroom Guide, How to Responsibly Report on Hacks and Disinformation. And I, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Janine, who is going to lead this conversation with Ambassador Martin Indyk. Thanks so much, Janine. Thank you, Carla. It's such an honor for me to be with you today again at World Affairs, leading a discussion with Ambassador Indyk about his terrific new book, Master of the Game, Henry Kissinger and the Art of Middle East Diplomacy. Today, we're going to explore how Secretary Kissinger's dealings in the Middle East can inform our current US decision-making and policies in the region, among many other things. But first, a few housekeeping notes. We will be integrating your questions later on in the program, so please feel free to put them in the Q&A in the Zoom box. And also please note that we are recording this program for the World Affairs radio show and podcast, which is why you might see a big microphone in my face here. <laughs> so it's my great pleasure to introduce a Martin Indyk, a distinguished fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, a two-time US ambassador to Israel from 95 to 97, and again, 2000 to 2001, and could have been a third time uh, ambassador, I guess, um, if I read the book correctly, that Secretary Albright had offered him a third time, but that he declined. So maybe we'll hear a little bit about that. Ambassador Indyk also served as Special Assistant to President Bill Clinton and Senior Director for Near East and South Asian Affairs of the National Security Council, and as Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs at the State Department. Later, he was President Obama's Special Envoy for Israeli-Palestinian Peace Negotiations, and he also held many, many positions at the Brookings Institution in Washington. So welcome, Ambassador Indyk, to Thank our you, chat. Great to I be with you. I wanted to note that for those who are listening, um, Ambassador Indyk has a bit of a cold, so um, if his voice sounds a little gravelly, that's why. So, so Ambassador Indyk, in preparing for this uh, event, in addition to reading your terrific book, I, I took a little walk down memory lane. And I realized that I started my career reporting on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in 1995. 26 years ago, my first job at the Jerusalem port report bi-weekly, and it was a few months before the assassination of Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, arguably one of the most consequential and devastating developments uh, perhaps in Israeli history. And he, of course, figures prominently throughout your book. And it was also the first year you became ambassador to Israel. So I realized I've been interviewing you for more than a quarter century. So I was like, oh my God, we've been doing this a long time. And what struck me in doing that review and reading your book is that the stories that I wrote and interviewed you for 20 years ago are still relevant today. And they were relevant back then. And there, it, it, so much is still the same. And when you went back to, uh, to Tel Aviv in 2000 as ambassador, I wrote in the Jerusalem Post, for example, when I was, when I was at the Jerusalem Post, that that decision to send you back gives, quote, Barack, Ehud Barak, the then prime minister, a direct line to Bill Clinton, to President Clinton and makes the ambassador in Washington less essential to diplomacy. Sorry, David Ivry. But the reason I bring this up is because this theme comes out in your book, Israel trying to bypass the foreign ministry and the State Department have a direct line to the White House. So I think that's something we can talk about 
And then I was laughing a little bit. In September 2000, shortly after the eruption of the Second Intifada and the collapse of the Camp David summit, uh, you made a comment in a speech about how Jerusalem cannot be, quote, the exclusive preserve of one religion. And at the time, Ehud Olmert, uh, former mayor of Jerusalem, former prime minister of Israel says, I don't know that Martin Indyk is a religious commentator and I don't need him or any other to advise us on how to live in complete religious freedom. And I've been thinking really since President Trump moved the embassy uh, to Jerusalem, which I think we'll, we'll hopefully get to today, sort of how US officials talk about Jerusalem, how are we gonna resolve the issue of Jerusalem, still a very live topic. And now here we are with really no viable peace process at all today. And then I sat down to read this book and you've written a terrific book about the origins of the American led peace process. It's a thrilling narrative. And I thought we would just start with why you decided to write this book now. Well, thank you, Janine. <clears throat> I remember those days very well. And it's good to be back with you. Mm -hmm. I apologize to everybody for my voice and I hope you can understand me. And uh, if I have to cut off to cough, I hope you'll understand that too. Um, you know, there are plenty of books written about Henry Kissinger, loads and loads of them, including ones he wrote himself. Um, but there's really nothing that's been written on the four years as Secretary of State that he spent uh, making peace in the Middle East. And this was truly the, the focus of his diplomacy as America's chief diplomat. China, the opening to China, they talk with the Soviet Union, Vietnam War and peace negotiations, all of that was done while he was national security advisor before he became secretary of state. So I wanted to look at that period, particularly because, not only because it hadn't been done before, but also because I had just come off another failed effort under uh, Secretary of State Kerry and Barack Obama, I was the envoy, as you said, for the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. The last negotiations we've had, actually, and that was seven years ago. And instead of writing about another failure, I wanted to go back and look at a successful effort. Kissinger negotiated four Arab-Israeli agreements, a ceasefire in the Yom Kippur War in 1973, and then two interim agreements between Israel and Egypt and one between Israel and Syria on the Golan Heights. And as you said, he laid the foundations for the American-led Arab-Israeli peace process. He effectively took Egypt out of the conflict, changed, removed the state-to-state -state conflict from the relationship, used the Israel-Syria agreement to legitimize what Egypt was doing, established calm on the Golan Heights for 40 years. I mean, it was a very successful effort. So I wanted to go back and look at it. And the advantage of doing so now is that there's a treasure trove of historical documents from that period. All of Kissinger's conversations, all of his negotiations, all of his phone conversations were, were documented and are now available. And the Israeli archives for that period are open as well. And I had access to, to Kissinger himself who at 98 years old still remembers a great deal about what happened then amazingly. And so I could triangulate all of that with my own experiences. I'd been in the rooms where he had been. I had negotiated with some of the leaders like Yitzhak Rabin, Hafez al-Assad, King Hussein, that he had negotiated with. And so I tried to, in the book, not only tell the story, kind of deep history of what actually happened, but illuminate the diplomacy with my own experiences. Yeah, and, and you, you do it so successfully. I mean, it's that's what makes this, takes it from a dry history to, I mean, you really bring it alive and these pivots between what Kissinger was doing and then what you were doing and the similarities. I mean, it was just so fascinating. Um, yeah, so one of the things, you know, you talk about reverentially about his 30 years of stability that he presided over, I suppose, in the region. And, and I guess what you're hoping is that people would read this now and learn some lessons. But the Mideast we're looking at today is so very different from the great powers of that time. And, you know, this post-Arab spring, post-Iraq war, states collapsing, 
before our eyes right now, Iran ascendant, um, non-state actors, uh, you know, so how, it's so very different. So how would what Kissinger did apply to today? Well, you're right, it is different in those ways. And also it was at the height of the Cold War in which competition with the Soviet Union kind of dominated the, the US policy, including in the Middle East, where the Soviet Union was backing Arab radical clients like Egypt, Syria, Iraq. Um, so in, yes, in many ways it's, it's different, but in many ways it's the same. Kissinger engaged in the Middle East coming off the withdrawal from Vietnam, just like Biden today is coming off the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Uh, Biden wants to engage in relentless diplomacy. Kissinger's diplomacy was nothing if not relentless. He spent 30 days on the road out in the Middle East, nonstop, 13 shuttles back and forth between Jerusalem and Damascus, for example just to get the Israeli-Syrian disengagement agreement. Um, and it was a time of domestic turmoil in the United States, just like it's domestic turmoil today. In those days, of course, it was the impeachment of Richard Nixon that was taking place while he was negotiating. So in some ways, there are some quite interesting similarities. Yes, the region has changed in some ways for the worse, in some ways for the better. Uh, the Israel-Egypt peace treaty, which he laid the foundations for, uh, has held through all of that, through revolutions, assassinations, counter-revolutions, and so on. The Israel-Jordan peace treaty is also a result of the process that he started, and that too has held. And we have the Oslo process that um, we can debate about um, whether, whether it uh, was a good thing or a bad thing, but it essentially changed the nature of the dynamic between Israel and the Palestinians. And it remains today as the only agreement between the Israelis and the Palestinians. I think we should come back to that. But, but what, what is important, I think, about the way that Kissinger approached it that is uh, important for today is that he was skeptical of peace. He thought that the pursuit of peace with too much passion too much effort by American presidents to achieve immortality or a Nobel Peace Prize, had the great danger of achieving the opposite, of destabilizing the order. And so his focus was on a much more gradual, incremental, step-by-step -step approach. That's what he called step-by-step -step diplomacy. And his logic was that the Israel needs time to strengthen itself, to re reduce its isolation, to overcome the trauma of the 73 war. And it can therefore only make territorial concessions in small steps, excuse me. Uh, it can only digest small steps of territorial withdrawal. And the Arabs in his view, weren't ready to reconcile with Israel, weren't ready to end the conflict with Israel. And therefore, they too needed time to get used to that, to exhaust their powers until they finally came to accept Israel. So from his point of view, it was a big mistake to try to jump, to end the conflict. What they needed to be was a process of peacemaking. And his emphasis was on the process. You, you, I'm sure, will recall how we all kind of got fed up with that. So there's too much process, not enough peace. Well, we were wrong, and he was right. What we needed then and what we need now is a process that will lead eventually to ending the conflict. But we can't get there from here, and therefore we need a process, a step-by-step, -step, gradual, incremental process. And that's the essential lesson of Henry Kissinger's diplomacy. You know, I guess it's... Um... It was proven true in a way in 2000, right? With the collapse of the Camp David summit, this last ditch, last year of the Clinton administration effort to try and get to, to, to get Arafat and Barack to do the deal. I mean, there are a lot of, there's been books written about why that summit collapsed. But of course you have the outbreak of the second Intifada and five years of violence subsequent to that. 
Um, it's still striking, Martin, though, to read you right that he, because he believed that peace was neither an achievable nor even a desirable objective in the Middle East. You know, I mean, the, the fact that, you know, he was so m much more concerned with stability, order, that and that peace could just be a transient thing. You'd have to always worry about it was still, I don't know, sort of disturbing. And, and, and you know, as someone who covered not only the big summits, but the incremental withdrawal from area A, B, disengagement, there was a lot of incrementalism over the last 25 years. And, and now we're at a state of nothing, at a state where Mahmoud Abbas is not well, uh, the, you know, and, and who knows what will happen once he's gone. Um, is there not peril also in incrementalism? Yes, there is, but the peril, the experience is the peril was greater by trying to end the conflict. You see, what happened was that Rabin was a late convert to incrementalism. When he was prime minister the first time and he engaged with Kissinger back in the 70s, he wanted to jump to peace. And he was insisting, Kissinger, that he would only evacuate the strategic passes in the Sinai in exchange for non-belligerency from Egypt. And Kissinger, if he'd gone to Sadat, he probably could have convinced Sadat to accept non-belligerency because Sadat was ready for peace, as we saw two years later. But Kissinger was so skeptical about it that he didn't push Sadat. And Rabin, said no and refused to do the deal because he couldn't get non-belligerency for giving up the passes and the oil fields in the Sinai. And Kissinger had a knockdown, drag out fight with him, withheld arms to Israel for four months. Imagine doing that today, couldn't do it for four minutes. And, and eventually brought uh, Rabin and Perez, who was defense minister and a real hawk in those days, believe it or not, eventually brought them around to accepting the deal. And they made the deal, and then Jimmy Carter made the peace deal two years later. When Rabin came to deal with the Palestinians, he adopted, exactly as you suggested, the incremental approach of Kissinger. The Oslo Accords were totally Kissingerian. Three steps of phased withdrawal, no end game, there's nothing in there about a Palestinian state, nothing in the Oslo Accords about Jerusalem or refugees, no sacred dates, an incremental process that would eventually lead to a final, final status negotiation. And that, that was Kissinger's approach. It was working like that until Rabin was assassinated. And then Netanyahu stalled the whole process. We had to slap him to give up 13% of the West Bank, a huge effort, which really raised questions about the value of incrementalism. And then Barack came along and said, let's forget about all of that. Let's just go and finish it. In Clinton's last year and Barack's first year, we'll just do the deal. And so he convinced Clinton, and Clinton and Barack slept Arafat to Camp David. Arafat did not want to go. And I remember Barack the physical and, image of them like pushing him exactly. into the into the cabin, right? Exactly. <laughs> Physically. Exactly. <laughs> that, that was a symbol of it. And Barack insisted on a conflict-ending negotiation. Kissinger would have never done that. Rabin would have never done that because they knew that it was a gradual process, that Arafat wasn't ready to end the conflict. And so instead of sticking with the, the incremental approach, we went along with the effort to end it. And, and, you know, I have to tell this story if you'll allow me. Of course. Because I interviewed... Kissinger about 12 times. The last interview, I said to him, did you ever regret not uh, going for the peace between Israel and Egypt? Because all of the documents show that they were both ready and that you weren't. You, you were the one that would 
dragged your feet. And he said, no, I don't regret it. I'm glad that it happened, but I don't regret that I didn't go for it because I was always scared that if I pushed too hard, I would break it. And that was like a light bulb going off in my head because that's exactly what we did. And I say we because I was at Camp David. I was part of Clinton's peace team. We pushed too hard and we broke it. And the Intifada broke out after that, after the failure of Camp David. And as a result of that, five years of, of incredible violence, thousands of people killed on both sides, and it broke the process, it broke the trust. And we've never been able to put it together again, notwithstanding the efforts of three more presidents who tried for an end game. They all tried to end it. And we now know that it doesn't work. So that's why I think what we have to do is go back to a Kissingerian process of incrementalism as provided for in the original Oslo Accords. Yeah, this idea, it's just so many years though, Martin, of covering confidence building measures and, and all these things. I wonder if there will be a, a Palestinian appetite to go back to that, especially once Mahmoud Abbas passes from the scene. What's your take on that? Well, <clears throat> there will obviously be a period of um, sorting things out. It's not clear who the next uh, president of, of the Palestinian Authority will be. There'll be a struggle for power. We have to stay out of it. I think that's very important. And Israel should stay out of it too. And uh, they'll have to sort themselves out. Then they'll have to reconcile between Hamas and Fatah um, because there's no way to have, to have a, a final status negotiation unless there's a reconciliation. Um, the Palestinian polity has to be unified. Um, and that's all going to take time. But in the meantime, the Israelis are not ready. They don't agree either. You've got a left-right coalition government that cannot agree on what to do on the Palestinian issue. So that's, but, but the current Israeli government is taking economic steps. It is engaging again in this effort. What you disparage as confidence building, but what I think is absolutely essential is to rebuild some confidence, rebuild some trust, not just between the leaders, between, but between the people. We know what the final deal looks like, but we can't get there from here. So we need a pathway, and the pathway is incremental. The pathway is step by step, and it has to include not just economic measures, but also territorial measures. The new Israeli government has started on that route with the granting permits, excuse me, in Area C for Palestinians, that's a very small step, but it's in the right direction. And I think more needs to be done there to show the Palestinians that the 60% of the territory of the West Bank that Israel now completely controls will be part of the Palestinian state, at least a large part of that 60%. Well, it'll be interesting to see what this motley crew of a coalition, as you mentioned, led by Naftali Bennett, um, a pro-settlement party, like how far they can actually go if there's going to be any territorial aspects to that, if the government could even survive that. You know, one of the things you, you write about, Martin, uh, quite personally in the book is you write, quote, living through the Yom Kippur War and observing Kissinger's role in ending it generated in me the unshakable conviction that the United States hold, held the keys to peace in the Middle East. And it reminded me again of an interview we did 20 years ago where you said, it's because we are close to Israel that we can be influential in the process, right? Sort of uh, answering critics who say, oh, the US is, is too close to Israel. Is this still true in your view? Well, it was Kissinger's view in the first place. Um, Kissinger coming off the 1973 Yom Kippur War wanted to show that only the United States could deliver concessions from Israel and that the Arabs therefore had to turn to Washington and away from the Soviet Union. 
And that worked very well. That's exactly what Sadat did, what Assad did, and what all the other Arabs did, including Yasser Arafat and PLO. They all looked to Washington. In the um, intervening years, um, the United States raised question marks about its ability or willingness to deliver concessions from Israel, territorial concessions from Israel. In the Trump case, it was the exact opposite. They, they were encouraging Israel to annex territory rather than give up territory. So um, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, question marks raised about the role of the US, and whether we can be an honest broker. But the basic proposition has not changed. There's only one country in the world that can influence Israel if it chooses to, and that is the United States. China, Russia, Europe, nobody else has the influence that comes from the depth and breadth of our relationship. And let's be honest, also the amount of military assistance that we give Israel. We have a lot of leverage on Israel. We've chosen over the last few decades not to use it. But if you read the book, you'll see that Kissinger used it very effectively. And he used it for the benefit of Israel, not to detract from Israel's ability to survive and, and, and thrive, but rather to help it, um, to help it get over decisions that it could not make for domestic political reasons that were in its best interest, the best interests of the state. And I think that, that um, that's something that we need to, to learn about and, un and relearn and understand that pressure on Israel is not necessarily a bad thing for Israel. It can actually be a very good thing because Israeli domestic politics, and Kissinger was famous for saying, Israel has no foreign policy, it only has domestic politics. But Israeli domestic politics often makes it impossible for governments to make tough decisions unless they can say, the United States made me do it. Right, you're saying it gives them sort of cover in a way. And your little quip earlier about you couldn't freeze aid, freeze aid for four minutes now, never mind, what was it, four weeks or four months or, or whatever? Four months. Four, four months. months. Yeah. And I remember, again, going back 20 years, the Falcon, Israel selling a, a special kind of plane to China, and there was talk, should we suspend aid? These are always very contentious things. I mean, but in terms of the U.S.-Israel relationship and our own, you're talking about Israeli domestic politics, but American domestic politics, Right. Might this be changing given the way the Democratic Party is going? I mean, just this morning, November 3rd, the U.S. Commerce Department added an Israeli cyber intelligence companies, NSO, Kandiro, to a black list of companies engaging in activities contrary to the national security interests of the United States. There are areas, I mean, look at the Gaza war in May. I mean, there are areas where U.S. You know, you might have people saying in the U.S., why are we giving them all this aid? Why, you know, why are we doing all this, given what, what's happening that's contrary, according to our own Commerce Department, to our national security interests? Well, um, I think that in cases like that, we need to be very clear. Uh, and I'm glad that we are being clear. Um, and as so and Candy Rue, from what's being reported, we're up to all sorts of bad activities. Uh, the Ministry of Defense of Israel should have never given them licenses um, to, because it implicated the government of Israel in approving their activities. And um, they need to clean up their act. And I think, it, you know, they will. Um, but it's at those moments in which, and there, there aren't that many moments when the interests of the United States and Israel diverge. But when they do, the United States needs to stand up for its interests. I think it's self-evident, just as Israel would do the same. You know, one of the things, Martin, taking it just beyond the U.S.-Israel relationship, you have some, some guidance for President Biden in, in your a piece you wrote for Foreign Affairs, uh, you know, time to your book. And you talk about um, that after the end of the war in Afghanistan, there's this tent, there's this desire now to pivot away from the region. 
Um, and, and we've seen this before with other US governments who have wanted to pivot away from the broader Middle East. It's easier said than done, you say. And you say, though, that the, the, the Biden administration has to resist that temptation to neglect the issue. At the same time, you're saying they shouldn't be overly invested in an overly ambitious process. So you're back in the White House now, say, and you're trying to thread the needle between these two positions, right? Don't turn away, but don't get too involved, right? So what are, are we going to have another envoy type thing, Mitchell Zinni? Or are we going to, you know, how is this going to look? Yeah, it's kind of a Goldilocks solution. Not too hot, not too cold, just right. And it's not easy to do, but um, I think you put it very well. Um, we have other priorities in other parts of the world, and they are demanding the president's attention. We do not have a path forward to end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and establish and is independent Palestinian state living alongside Israel in peace. So um, we don't have the government's leadership to work with on the Israeli and Palestinian side. And there is no trust between the leaders or between the people. So um, in those circumstances, it naturally lends itself to a Kissingerian approach, a gradual incremental approach. It doesn't require us to invest a great deal of effort. It requires us to get behind efforts by the Israeli and Palestinian governments and encourage them to do so. It doesn't need an envoy to do that. And, and that is something that we need to do in the context of a broader effort that is also Kissingerian uh, in the sense of tending to the balance of power in the region. We can no longer dominate the region. We've got to deal with other regions. We've got to deal with China, we've got to deal with Russia, but we can support our allies in the region and have them, the Israel, Sunni Arab states, uh, join together in a loose alliance, which would be supported by the United States. And, and in that way, preserve the order while we try to move forward on issues like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to try to move them towards a resolution. It, you know, that was something that confused me a bit where you say that the United States is no longer the dominant player in the region, even as it <clears throat> remains the most influential. So do you mean by that, this, what you're referring to, the support for our allies, financial support, um, exactly. picking our partners? And exactly right. It's exactly that. It's we move from dominating the region to supporting others in maintaining a balance of power in favor of, of the status quo and stability there. You know, so when I, when I hear that, I'm taken back to 2003 <laughs> and President Bush's uh, big speech, big, we're going to state our new Middle East policy. We're still waiting for a Biden speech, I guess, of if he's ever going to do one, I doubt it. But anyway, the- There um, shouldn't be, there should not be a Biden speech. I know, That's I was guessing the, you would say that, but you remember- part of the Goldilocks solution. <laughs> okay, we'll make sure he gets the memo, but the National Endowment for Democracy, 60 years of tolerating these dictatorships in the Middle East did not make us safe look at 9-11 and so forth. And we are gonna now promote freedom and democracy, which you have words for this approach in your book, which I encourage people to go read. Um, but so, and now we're in a world though with Mohammed bin Salman and some other unsavory characters. And you seem to be suggesting we need to work with them. We need to work with them, with Israel against Iran. Is, am I misinterpreting this? We have no choice. We have to work with these unsavory characters. Um, I wouldn't put it that way, um, but we have to work with what, what we have to work with. I think just on, on the point about the Bush speech, um, this was all of the same kind of pattern that Kissinger warned against, is this notion that American presidents can reshape the Middle East in our image, either as a peaceful domain or as a democratic domain. 
and and this notion that we're going to come in to these cultures that we know really nothing about and try to reshape things and bring them democracy. Um, it doesn't work and we see it most clearly in Afghanistan. Um, and so we have to avoid overreaching. It doesn't mean that we should, should ignore human rights issues. Absolutely not. We should be concerned about those. Um, and we should stand up for the human rights of, of people in the region. We should be seeking to build uh, more accountable institutions, more transparent ones, more freedom of the press, all of those things. But again, uh, you're going to think I'm, I'm a broken record here. It's a gradual, incremental approach. We cannot impose our um, lifestyle and, and system uh, on the Middle East. It just won't work. And we should, if there's one thing we should have learned from the last four or five decades, it's that. So we have to come up with something that's more modest, more humble, but still engaged in trying to move the region forward in a positive direction. You know, a lot of those incremental steps are going to be economic, as you uh, mentioned, Martin. And also it was the, you know, the, the kinds of steps that Prime Minister Netanyahu himself, uh, now the longest serving prime minister until his ouster uh, earlier this year, was generally, you know, he could get behind even. Um, and there's a question here in the chat from an anonymous attendee that I'd like to bring in about Gaza. And, you know, can we, uh, you know, it seems to me that leadership of both Fatah and Hamas are completely out of tune with the day-to-day -day life of citizens in the West Bank and Gaza. It seems substantial economic development for Gaza must precede any ability for Gazan citizens to support peace with Israel. Yet the international community seems quite reluctant to contribute more to Gaza. And I raise this question as well, because often when we're talking about these economic incentives, confidence building measures, it's focused on the West Bank because the, at least the conventional wisdom goes, correct me if I'm wrong, Martin, if you, if you help Gaza, then you'll actually help Hamas. I mean, that's the way the Israelis seem to, to, to put it often. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that the question has come up because things are starting to move in Gaza. Um, and it's an uh, uh, important development, I think. First of all, the Israeli government uh, is changing the Israeli approach. Uh, Foreign Minister Lapid, who is the alternate prime minister, laid out a plan, a peace plan that starts with Gaza. And he called for a long-term uh, ceasefire which is exactly what Hamas called for. They called it a hudna. And, and so the, the idea of a long-term ceasefire in which um, Gaza is opened up by Israel in return for security steps that Egypt gets Hamas to take, while Qatar provides the funding for reconstruction and Israel allows Gazan workers to come into Israel. And that number could go up to 30 or 40,000. And that would make a, a huge difference to, to economic growth in Gaza, if that were to happen. And so you put Gaza in this positive trajectory. You, in the same time, try to reintroduce the Palestinian Authority. And, um, you do not oppose a Hamas-Palestinian Authority reconciliation, provided that it's clear that there won't be any engagement um, with, with Hamas unless it accepts Israel. Um, but accepting Israel in a process like this is the way to catch Hamas in its dilemma, which is to force it to choose between fighting Israel and feeding the people. And, and that can have the effect of pushing Hamas in a, in a more moderate direction. That can't be done in one step. It has to be done incrementally. And I think that that's, that is the way uh, that we need to move in Gaza. And I actually have some limited optimism there that 
things can actually move in a positive direction. Yeah, I mean, this whole question of whether the Palestinians, and you mentioned it at the top, you know, need to be reunited before the, before the Israelis can actually engage in a process with them. Um, you're suggesting that there is a way to move economically in Gaza, even before there's sort of a reconciliation between Fatah and Hamas? Correct. Yeah. That's what the Israeli got. That's what Foreign Minister Lapid laid yeah. out in his initiative. And uh, it leads to uh, reconciliation. It leads to the Palestinian Authority moving back into Gaza. But you don't, you, you start with, with this notion of a long-term ceasefire and security for Israel and opening for the Palestinians. So, and that gives Hamas a stake in not going back to firing rockets or center, in century balloons or so on. If you've got 30,000 Palestinian workers coming into Israel from Gaza and they start firing rockets, that's cut off immediately. And that will make them very unpopular at home. So, so you know, I think there is a way forward there. But I mean, I'll tell you from my own experience, Janine, mm. when we sat down in the last final status negotiations when I was the envoy, the Israelis would ask the Palestinian negotiators, okay, we're going to you know, we're going to have a peace agreement here. What are you going to do about Gaza? And the Palestinians had no answer. They said, well, let's just do the agreement. They said, we'll put the agreement on the shelf and then we'll deal with Gaza. Well, not surprisingly, the Israelis were not exactly happy with that answer. Um, and, and that's why I say there's no way you want to resolve this conflict. You've got to put the building blocks in. And one of the building blocks has got to be a, a unified Palestinian leadership that's capable of living up to its commitments and enforcing its commitments, not just in the West Bank, but also in Gaza. It's a huge challenge, right? I mean, they haven't had elections and... And there's one other, there's one other element that I should have added to this, yeah. which we haven't had before. And we haven't got into the Abraham Accords, but this is one way in which the Abraham Accords actually facilitates the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. Egypt and Jordan, because of the Abraham Accords, feel that they have cover to engage more with Israel, and that's what they're doing now. The Egyptians are taking a much more active role in Gaza than they've ever done before. And they have a presence on the ground there they're working with the Qataris. They used to fight the Qataris. They're, they're now coordinating. And, and you see the same thing beginning to happen in the West Bank with Jordan. The Palestinians need Egypt, an Egyptian state in Gaza and a Jordanian state in the West Bank to help them acquire the attributes of sovereignty and the responsibilities of sovereignty. And that's, I think, also a reason to believe that this incremental approach can work. You know, um, I remember uh, when Camp David collapsed, you know, there was some talk of, well, one of the reasons it collapsed was that the US didn't get the buy-in from the Arab states ahead of it to help bring that pressure to bear on Yasser Arafat. And throughout you know, the past few decades, perhaps even longer, there's been this question of, well, do we, can Israel, sort of bypass the Palestinian issue and just make these deals with these other Arab states uh, with which they have the uh, common enemy, namely of Iran, right? And they have these mutual interests beyond the Palestinian issue. So I guess, you know, you referred to President Trump's Abraham Accords, and there's a question here about our previous president's impact on the peace process. You've pointed to something uh, positive that has emerged, I believe, from the Abraham Accords in terms of, you know, getting this Qatari Egypt back in the game. But, you know, this, uh, this, I mean, there were other things too, right? I mean, there was, um, you know, the moving of the embassy, your former home, I mean, I guess to Jerusalem being one, is something that you, you, were, you were critical of that move. I mean, can we talk broadly about the impact of, of President Trump on the process? So um, the reason I was critical of the move was not because I opposed the recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. I've long supported that, but I've always, said that it has to be done in a way that doesn't 
damage the efforts to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And unfortunately, the way that Trump did it um, led to the Palestinians being deciding to just leave the process, stop talking to the administration. And basically, they had no ability to engage with the Palestinians after moving the embassy to Jerusalem. And so when they brought forward their plan, the Trump peace plan, not the Abraham Accords, but the Trump peace plan, they brought it forward. It was dead on arrival. Palestinians wouldn't even discuss it. Um, so that was the damage that, that occurred there. And people you know, say, oh, well, there was no blow up. There was no explosion. That's true. And that was a good thing. <laughs> but um, losing the Palestinians kind of didn't help Israel in terms of trying to move towards a resolution of the conflict. It was a zero sum game. And, and that's fine if all you care about is Israel. But if you care about an Israel at peace with its neighbors, then you've got to worry about the impact it has on the other side as well. And the Abraham Accords themselves were a good thing. Um, you know, Israel is one of the few countries in the world that has from its birth been denied basic recognition of its neighbors, which is the natural attribute of a sovereign state to be recognized by its neighbors. And so the normalization process that took place under the Abraham Accords was a, was a positive thing. It was, by the way, exactly what Kissinger uh, predicted would happen with his incremental process that eventually the Arabs would tire of the conflict. They would become exhausted by it and would accept Israel. It took 40 years for the Emiratis and the Bahrainis and the Moroccans and the Sudanese to come around to it, but they did. And what did the Emiratis say? They said exactly that. They said they were tired of the conflict in justifying their move. So, um, you know, I think that, 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 that in itself it's a positive thing. But as I said, it also can be used in a way to boost the incremental process of peacemaking between Israel and the Palestinians, not just in the ways that I've suggested through giving cover for Egypt and Jordan to engage with Israel, which is very important. But also, if you look at, the, at Saudi Arabia as the big prize, the jewel in the normalization crown, they need progress towards Palestinian solution. They don't insist anymore on an agreement, a final agreement, but they want progress. And progress is exactly what I'm suggesting is the Kissingerian way of making peace. And so I think if we can get some momentum through this step-by-step -step process, we'll see that the Saudis will also begin to take more steps towards Israel. You know, it's a, I mean, it just seemed to me that if our, if the US leverage is that we can bring Israel, deliver Israel to make concessions of any kind on, you know, maybe settlements or whatever, there's a question about settlements, you know, by, by, by putting your finger on Jerusalem, moving the embassy to Jerusalem, the most contentious, perhaps arguably of the final status issues on one side, it sort of takes you out of that honest broker game, I mean, in a way. So, I mean, the question is for me, how are you going to, well, I guess it doesn't matter, right? Because you're not arguing for really a, a, a robust peace process anyway at this point, right? Jerusalem does matter. So the Biden administration wants to reopen the consulate in Jerusalem as, as a diplomatic mission to deal with the Palestinians. The Israeli government's having a real hard time with that. They're opposing it. Um, the reason that the Biden administration wants to do that, it's a, it's a symbolic move. They want to show the Palestinians that they recognize their aspirations in Jerusalem. That's what Trump didn't do. He, when, he, when he announced moving the embassy to Jerusalem and recognizing his, Jerusalem as Israel's capital, he said, this has nothing to do with the final status negotiations, the final disposition of Jerusalem. That was good. But what he didn't say and what he should have said was, I also recognize 
that the Palestinians aspire to have their capital in East Jerusalem. Those words would have prevented the Palestinians from walking away, just recognizing their aspirations. And in one way or another, the Biden administration needs to do that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it'd be interesting to see if they actually pick it up, though, right? If they even go there and, and do, you know, any of these things, given how distracted things are. I mean, I remember when President Biden, then Vice President Biden, went to Jerusalem and he was meeting with Shimon Peres. It was in 2010, I think, 2011. And I counted with my friend, another reporter, Josh Mitnick, how many times President Biden referred to the relationship between the U.S. and Israel as unshakable or unbreakable, right? I mean, he is a person who has a long history with Israel um, of support. And yet he's got this party, the Democratic Party that he's dealing with that have different views about Israel. We kind of touched on that a little bit, Martin, but can you talk about that sort of this, you know, how the US support going forward is going to maybe change for Israel given the politics here? Yeah, sure. Well, we saw that very clearly in the Gaza, past Gaza uh, crisis in which um, Democrats, not just progressives, but some longtime supporters of Israel on the Democratic side uh, were critical of, of Israel's actions. And that was a new thing. Not Joe Biden, by the way, he was determined to stand by Israel and its right to defend itself. But I think what you've got is a, a historical trend which started some time ago, where his support for Israel, amongst Democrats started to decline, maybe 10, starting 10 years ago, and support for Israel among Republicans started to increase to the point where today there's a more than 40 point gap between Republican support for Israel and Democratic support for Israel. And it was only a matter of time before that caught up with congressional opinion. It was a kind of lag factor. But eventually the, the Democratic representatives had to respond to this secular change uh, that was taking place. And so the Democrats now are in a situation where um, they need, a, in order to, to square the circle between the camp that supports Israel, which is still very strong in the party, and the camp that, that wants to see a Palestinian state, essentially the progressives, between the American Jews who are the, the backbone, one of the backbones, if you like, of the Democratic Party, who support Israel, and those American Jews who are with the progressives. I mean, there's a split in the party, which is bad for the party, unless they can find a way to bring the two sides together. And the only way they can bring the two sides together is to have an incremental peace process. And that's, that's the, the solution, is uh, for the, the Democratic president, the Democratic party, to be pursuing a pathway towards an Israeli-Palestinian uh, peace that provides for the establishment of an independent Palestinian state. I just want to add one other thing. I know there are a lot of people that say there'll never be a Palestinian state. Palestinians don't want it anymore. You know, it's, it's yesterday's answer to today's problems. Well, the problem is today's answers are not answers. They're just recipes for continuing the conflict, whether it's a one-state solution on the Hamas model or a binational bi state on Palestinian model or a one-state solution on the settlers model in Israel. That won't resolve the conflict. And, and so the only way, in my view, remains to honor Palestinian right to determine their own future, but not to determine the future of Israel. And that requires a two-state solution. Yeah, we only have another uh, three or so minutes, Martin, and maybe, you know, that is a good way to end it. But I do want to 
say there's a couple people asking something about what they can do to help facilitate you know connections between jews and arabs and muslims and christians how can we create the space for reconnecting the polities over there i mean there's so few places where there actually is this interaction even though they're living on top of each other <laughs> the israelis and the palestinians do you have any final thoughts on that yeah i think it's it's important to do that i, I really believe that it needs a bottom up and a top down process you can't do one without the other we need a political process that the leaders are engaged in but we also need a bottom up uh, approach and and Nita Lowy, a famous Jewish congresswoman from New York, is retired now, but her last act as head of the Appropriations Committee uh, passed the, what became known as the Nita Lowy Act to put funding, serious funding, $50 million a year, into precisely these kinds of people to people projects. And so there will be in the next year a new project standing up. NGOs have been involved in this for a long time, getting serious funding now to, in, to promote this people-to-people -people, uh, efforts. And I think there'll be plenty of, of ways in which Americans who want to get involved in that uh, can do so. All right. Well, thank you so much, Ambassador Indic, for today's conversation and for making it through with your illness um, and for sharing your insights and thanks to you our audience for taking the time to be with us if you enjoyed today's program please join us again on november 16th at 11 a.m for world affairs next event with senior russia expert fiona hill and world affairs radio program podcast host ray suarez it's part of the global speaker series with the pacific council on international policy it's going to be a great event so please sign up online at worldaffairs.org Thank you again, and have a great day. Thank you, Janine. Great to see you. Good to see you.